Woo woo. Woo woo. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Didn't see you there. Um, it's not what it looks like. It's convolution. Okay, everyone. Welcome back to another fun-filled session of ECE 2002. This is lecture 12. I'm Art Turlip. Let's get started. So, I bring this up because um, this is the convolution chapter, right? And so, notoriously, every student will say the wrong thing when they talk about convolution. They'll say something is convoluted. So, I want to make sure that you know the difference between convoluted and convolution, okay? Uh, to convolve is the verb form. Uh, convolution is the noun form, all right? Convoluted is this chart <laughs> right here. And you're probably wondering, what the heck are you looking at? Uh, fun fact, this actually, as it turns out, is was relevant to my job in the Air Force. And I had to be familiar with this chart and all the crap that's in it. So you can imagine how much this all costs. It's a, it's a lot. It's all just wasted money. <laughs> so there's your inspiration for all you ROTC guys and girls out there. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, um, not to say there wasn't like fantastic things that I got to do when I was in. Um, so don't get me wrong. You'll drop out of your, your ROTC program. If, if you, you know, you're in one, just know that there's a lot of kind of eluded stuff. All right. Now that we've made the distinction, let's move into convolution. So we have chapter 13 today. We're covering convolution. Convolution is so exciting because it's something new and uh, it's going to haunt us the rest of our days as electrical engineers. So we're going to discuss what it is, but first uh, we have to get over some of the basics, um, some good lead in, and then we're going to discuss all those handy properties that it uh, employs. Um, and then later on, in the coming chapters, what we're going to do is find other uses for this particular operation that we're doing. Okay? So, before we dig into the material, a little side quest for you all. Uh, Oliver Heaviside is a renowned self-taught electrical engineer, among many other things. But he's just an absolute giant in the field. Um, developed transmission line theory, the tel uh, telegrapher's equations. Uh, contributed to Maxwell's equations, which you probably have seen, I hope, from uh, at this point in time in your career, and uh, coined many of the EE terms that we use today, including stuff like admittance, impedance, and permeability. So, huge big deal, right? Um, funny story. Uh, so, the heavy side function, as we'll see, looks like this, right? It's just one up here and zero down here. Um, so I actually thought when I was an undergrad, because mathematicians typically refer to this as, uh, the heavy side function, um, engineers tend to favor step function. It really doesn't matter either way, but I saw this function. I said, oh yeah, heavy side. That makes sense. Uh, one side is heavier than the other. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, <laughs> that's not where it comes from. It's the dude's name. All right. So. Yeah, now you know. I, I didn't learn that until I was probably like a, a junior or a, a senior, I think. Uh, I didn't realize that it was some guy's name. Um, and that this person was, in fact, very important. So, you know, invest in, you know, the history of your career field a little bit. And, and go take a minute and go look up this guy. Okay, that's my plug for uh, history for the moment. Okay. So let's go ahead and dig into those, uh, those couple of functions we need to get and uh, look at some basic function transform review, which I asked you to look at uh, in preparation for today. So to start off, we're going to look at the, and from here on out, I'm going to just call it the unit step function or just the step function. And we define it as follows. Here's T. 
Here's U, T. And it's zero right until it gets to zero. And then at zero, it jumps up. And it stays at one happily ever afterward. Okay? So that's it. That's the whole function. Uh, we can define it, we can write it like this as piecewise. So it's zero for uh, t less than zero and one for t greater than or equal to zero. Now this doesn't seem very significant at first, but when you start building these things together, let's say that uh, we want to make a little pulse shape like so. And let's say that this is at t1 and this is at t2. Well, an easy way to do that would be to um, have a heavy side function that's centered at t1. How would you do that? Well, you would write u of t, and then we want to shift it to t1 so that it, at t1 it jumps. So remember that the heavy side function jumps at input equal to zero. So what I need to do here or what I've done here, is I've said at t, uh, oops, at t equal t1, I want a jump. And so by setting this uh, argument inside here equal to t minus t1, I know that when these two quantities are equal to each other, it will jump at that particular spot. By keeping the variable positive, I know that my orientation is going to stay in this shape. Okay, so it's positive on the outside, positive on the inside, it's going to stay in this shape, I'm just shifting it along the x or the uh, the t axis by uh, by doing this minus t1. All right. Oh, I wrote that. Okay, so then I want the same thing here, but I want it to jump back down. So how do I do that? Well, this function here, u of t minus t1, so here's u of t minus t1, here's u, u of t minus t2, okay? So this one is jumping at t2, this one's jumping at t1. If you see here, this is just 1 and 1, so if I subtracted, the only, the only place where this function, this function is greater than 0, or different than 0, is after t2. If I subtract it from this guy over here, then it's just going to drop everything together. So let's add these, uh, I'm sorry, let's do this guy minus this guy, okay? Okay, I'm going along, happy as a clam, and I jump up at T1. Remember that this part is still zero. I keep going along until I hit T2. When I get to T2, this quantity becomes one, but I'm subtracting it off. And this is already equal to one, right? So now at T2, I simply drop back down and carry on my merry way like nothing ever happened. And so that's how you create a nice little pulse. So let me write that up here real quick. I should, this is specifically a square pulse. There are a lot of different shapes you can make with pulses and stuff, and you can tack other functions onto the step function and combine step functions together but by and large, this is um, the the step function is the fundamental building block of signals that you're going to be using for the rest of your time. Another useful signal that we like to call upon is very entrenched in calculus. In fact, we can't even define it without calculus. So it's the, uh, whoops, that was a little large. It's called the unit impulse function. 
delta. And this is the Dirac delta function. There are two delta functions. Okay. And the reason we make the distinction is because we use them in, in two different uh, ways. So this one is the continuous version is what we call Dirac. The other one is called uh, Kronecker. So this is the one that we're doing today. Okay, and this is the one that is entrenched really heavily in calculus. Um, so when you think about delta functions, typically in your career, the one you're usually going to run into the most actually is the Kronecker delta function, and we'll talk about why. It actually has to do with the fact that most of the time you're dealing with discrete processes, almost almost always. Um, if you, Especially for those of you that are like coding and modeling and doing stuff like that. Um, it's not to, to say that you won't ever deal with a Dirac, but typically you'll deal with a Dirac delta function more when you're dealing with theory or modeling the mathematics prior to implementation. Okay? They're very similar to each other. They're, they're not that different. Here we go. If we take the integral of the delta function, and you guys hopefully have seen this trick before, um, if you want a, a function to spit out a particular variable, you can put it in the limits of integration. That's a secret. That's a little mathematician secret. Don't tell anyone. But anything that you integrate over, by the way, it disappears. So when you do calculus, when you perform this operation, your argument that you integrate over goes away. Okay? And what you're left with is whatever your limits of integration were or whatever other variables um, that you had inside your your function that you integrated. So tau here is just a placeholder, right? It's just a placeholder to define the limits of the function that we're looking at. And those limits, one of them happens to be a variable limit. Okay? So don't get too confused by this. This is not a very friendly definition, is it? But it takes us back to our, <laughs> our step function, doesn't it? So what does this actually look like? Well, one possible way to think about the, the delta function, the impulse function, is as a series, a converging series, of rectangles of area one, okay? And you can see this in the book. So let me pull it up for you. So take a look in your book. Uh, it's there for you. But as this gets tighter and tighter, this squeezes it up like a tube of toothpaste. And as this width gets infinitesimally small, this height gets infinitely high. Okay? No matter how much you squeeze it and squish it, this is always going to have an area underneath it equal to 1. This is why I prefer a Leibniz approach to calculus, because this is actually quite an easy thing to think about in that framework if you have the tools of an infinitesimal uh, number system at play. So I think I said that in here. Oh, yeah. If you want to reference, uh, this is a very fun book to uh, look at. Um, it's kind of basic, but, you know, that's probably where you're, you're at if you're interested in... Uh, dealing with different kinds of infinite numbers and so forth. And if you have any interest in, um, you know, that kind of extended number theory, let me know. And, uh, I can recommend some good classes and some good books for you guys. Um, this is, this is my, uh, my domain that I, I really enjoy is, uh, this kind of stuff. So anyways, um, there you have it. So that's, that's our function. We define it, and I actually, you can either say that the middle here is undefined. I like to say it's actually infinite, because it, it provides a little bit of 
intuition about what's actually occurring at that point. Um, the flavor of infinite or using it in a uh, in an expression is kind of a little bit of a no no unless you unless you know what you're doing. Um, but by and large, this works okay. All right. So by extension, because of the friendliness of this definition, this actually totally works. Uh, whoopsies. I'm going to leave these off, actually. There we are. This is just equal to delta t. So if we think about it, the derivative of this, uh, our, our heavy side function, is zero always, except right at t, where it suddenly jumps up. Or, I'm sorry, right at zero. Excuse me, not right at t, right at zero. So, if we're looking at the derivative of our, our heavy side function, it's here, it jumps up, and then it's zero again. The hole right there. And that's exactly what the delta function looks like. These two definitions work in tandem. Okay, they're the same definition, just written two different ways. So, in summary... This is the integral version, and this is the uh, summation version, okay, of, of a similar phenomenon. Okay, let's move into function transform review. Here we have a list of operations that we can do to a function. And by and large, the form that we're going to look at here is this generalized form. Oopsies. Now, this is more than what we need to really describe the process of convolution, to be honest. Um, the biggest thing with convolution is just the reflections and the translations, or the shifting. We don't really do any stretching or skewing uh, with a convolution operation. But we do do a, a flip and a translation, a continuous translation with convolution. So that's why this is important. So if I have a function, an original function, f of t, and I do stuff to it, this is a good summary of all the things that I can do to it. So these four parameters in this case summarize some of the nice uh, transforms that I can apply to a, a friendly function. Uh, the book actually walks through how these transforms work, but the focus here that I want you to look at is just what happens when I do a reflection um, inside here and focus on the order of things. Okay? So... I encourage you to go read that um, that section here. If it's something you're not familiar with, uh, it's a really good review. And this is stuff that you should have done in algebra, okay? So let's look at this example real quick, because this has to do with our step function, and it's pretty relevant to uh, what we do down the road. This is just like how we did that pulse earlier, right? We're just taking... Uh, taking it and breaking it into two parts. This one is unshifted. It's at zero. So if we wanted a pulse that was, say, at t equals zero here, and then at t equal one, and it's just a nice pulse of area one. It's very handy. And then I could just subtract F2 from F1 here, and it would give me that nice little pulse. Okay? So... Uh, effectively, you could add together, oh, excuse me, uh, you would add together F1 and F2 because I've already put the minus sign in here for you, okay? So that's uh, that's pretty much all this example is showing. Okay, now for this example, what we have is something quite different. So in this particular case, what we've done is we've applied a negative next to T. So what does that do? Well, when we look at the previous example, 
we had a minus on the outside, it reflected it across the x-axis, right? And you can go back to your rules and see that that's true. I applied a negative to the outside, it reflects it across that x-axis, okay? Now if I apply it to the inside, it reflects it around the y-axis. So let's take a look. Ah, so I did. I, I reflected it across the y-axis, right, because it's flipped around this way. And then it's also been shifted. So the order in which these two operations occur is important, right? If I shift and then flip, or I flip and then shift, it can make a big difference. So the big takeaway here that I want you to use constantly is if you ever get lost, the best thing to do is just ask yourself, where, where is this internal argument equal to zero? When is this equal to zero? That'll tell you every time what's going on there. And you know that it's been reflected, right, across that y-axis. So nine times out of ten, you've got the work done for you. So you don't even have to think about the order. But if you get confused about the order in which to do things, you know, and you're not familiar with the, the order of operations that you apply for transforms, read through this section and re-familiarize yourself with it. Okay? It's very helpful. All right, so knowing that now, we should be very confident that if I put in t equals 1 here, I know that this is going to drop, drop or jump at, at 1. Now if I uh, were to add these two functions together, it's equal to 1, 1, 1, 1, and over here it's just 1, but in the middle, both of these are equal to 1, so it's going to jump up to 2, so the final... Um, sum is going to look like, oops, final sum is going to look like this, where this is at 2 and this is at 1. More interesting, however, is if I take their product. So if I take the product of these two functions, then what I end up with is 1 times 0 all the way through here, and then at this point here, until this point here, it's equal to 1. It's just 1 times 1. And then ever after, it's just 0. So then this actually produces, by multiplication, this produces that same function that we, we had there where it's at 0, 1, nice pulse of area 1. Interesting. So I've created the same function by two different processes. I can add these two together, or I can multiply these two together. So the way we're going to approach convolution, as it turns out, is by multiplication. Because this isn't going to give us very interesting results. I'll put it that way. Um, though it is another way to construct such a function. So this is, you need to understand how to, how to construct these two, what they look like on a graph, and how to multiply them together in order to understand convolution. All right, so read if it doesn't make sense. Okay. Now let's get into convolution. So, I have two trains. And this is where this is coming from, okay? I have a train on the T-track and a train, excuse me, another train, a totally different train on the T-track as well. Both of these trains, i.e. functions, okay, they both start at time T equals zero and they go on, maybe they go on indefinitely, but we're really concerned with ones that are um, kind of finite in length, all right? We don't want them to go on for too long because otherwise it gets kind of complicated to deal with them. But you can. At the very least, we'd like them to converge and taper off. Okay, that's usually a nice requirement. So our, our exponentially decaying functions, those are great for convolution, okay? 
because they just go like so. They have a, a nice starting point. I know where the front of the train is, right? I know how high the, the front of the train is. And they just taper off real nice and smooth and they converge to zero. Or as it goes to infinity, right? It gets closer and closer to zero. So I can kind of see where the, the end of the, the line is, so to speak. So the basic convolution operation is defined by this equation. This is it. This is the definition, okay? The convolution of two functions is an integral over that product that we talked about earlier of one function shifted or reflected and shifted times another function. Okay? So recall that when we were looking at the textbook here, we had this function here is just kind of hanging on, sitting tight, and this function here, we could actually rewrite this, and I'm going to, as positive 1 minus t. And the reason I write it this way is so that you can see the form here is very similar to this g of t minus tau. f becomes a function of tau, and then we integrate over tau. So what did we say when we integrate over a particular variable? That variable goes away. And what's left over is just whatever variables were inside of this function to begin with that weren't integrated out, i.e. t is all we have left. Okay? So this doesn't mean that f is not a function of t anymore or something like that. We're just doing a convenient substitution to run over everything that's here. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, we are switching out the running variable, uh, variable, okay, from t to tau. And what we're going to do, because we want an output function with respect to time still, okay, so we're going to actually keep t around, but we're going to put it right there as a running index of how much we shift the other function. Okay, and the output, we write, you can write it as this or like this. All of these are acceptable. Okay, but our final output of the convolved function is a function of t, okay? Because we integrated over taus, so these taus are gonna are gonna go away over that integral, and the only variable that should be output is t. All right, so let's take a look at our train for some insight here. Um, looking back at this example, okay, what's actually going on here is I'm changing this variable now to a to a tau. Okay, so this becomes tau, and this becomes tau, if we were using these two functions as an example, say. And what I'm really doing is I'm taking any kind of constants right here. So let me write this function out a little bit larger so you can see what's going on. So this is u of, I'm going to rewrite it as 1 minus tau, and this is just u of tau, okay? And remember, we multiplied these two together to get this nice little pulse here, right? And if we we said, hey, this guy had area 1, well, what's another way to measure area? Right? You take the integral, right? So if I take the integral of this, this function here, I end up with an area, if I take the integral of this function here, I end up with an area equal to 1 for that particular value for that particular value, okay? Now, what happens if I were to change what this is? Well, then my area would change, right? And as a matter of fact, if I ran this over a number of different possible values, let's say I had a, the entire spectrum of values, and if I called that po all the possibilities of values equal to t, then if I integrate over... Um, not t, 
but I integrate over tau, right? Because this is on the this is on the tau track, right? This integral would be with respect to tau now, because I've changed my parameter. Then I end up with the area under this curve of these two functions multiplied to each other for all possible values as I'm shifting this red function left or right. And as it turns out, we, we run the index, you know, over a well-ordered set. So it's just as it moves to the, to the right, as a matter of fact. And so this is where that train analogy comes into play. If you were to imagine our original uh, two functions were just two trains, right, that look like this and like this, they're exactly identical, they're both just u of t, then if I wanted to measure the area under their intersection, under their their um, product, right? I wanted to measure the size of this, this pulse for all possible values inside here, or I've shifted it for all possible shifted values. Then what I do is I re would reflect this guy across the axis, and I'd run it through all possible values. I need to replace these actually, I apologize. These, I switch these to tau so that I have a nice running variable here. And I run this over all possible values of t to see what the area is at each amount of shift. It's not gonna make sense the first time. So let me explain it again. Here's my first function. Here's my second function. I take my second function I flip it over the axis, and then I ram this thing into my first function. They should meet, unless, unless this guy has some other shift to it that I'm not aware of. Right? If they both start at time t equals zero, and I've placed them on a new tau track, they should intersect at tau, uh, tau is equal to zero when t is equal to zero. Okay, back to the train crash. So as I move this train forward, I use this function, and this is a very important function to note here. Oops. This function is crashing into f of tau. Okay, we're multiplying them together. So this is the amount of shift along the tau track that I've done. And I'm going to change that amount of shift that I'm doing while measuring the amount of crashing, i.e. the product of the overlap of these two functions as g gets shifted down the tau track. We call the amount of shift t. Okay? And we can plot the overlap with respect to time. That's this graphic here, right? The amount of overlap when it's far away, when I've shifted it backwards, I've, I've backed it up, is still zero until I get to time t equals zero, and then this starts to crash, and whatever the overlap is, whatever their product is, we're going to look at the area under that curve, the area under the product of those two functions. And that determines what the value of the convolution is at that time step t. Okay, so here's our example. I've got two functions, this one, and this is one that is just at a particular time step of t. So at t equal 1, my output for the convolution will be the area under this curve, which this curve represents the product of those two functions, one having been shifted and overlapped with the other. I know, this is a weird operation. That pretty much sums it up 
for how to perform physically that operation. Some of you, it's going to help. Some of you, it's going to make it more confusing. Let's turn to the calculus then for yet another explanation of this operation. So all I'm doing here is I'm, I have two functions. Oops. Start with f of t and g of t. Replace, oops, let me do it this way. Replace t with tau, okay? And then shift, I guess flip and shift, g of tau by a amount, which we'll call, we call that t. Okay, that's going to be our new T. And measure the area under their product. Read through the textbook, read through the examples, and I'm going to put some additional resources online for you guys to try to understand this. I will tell you that this concept was by far the hardest one uh, for students when I was TAing for this class back in the fall. Uh, I don't want that to be the case this time around. So, something is unclear, or if you just want to ask a clarifying question, please do so on the Brightspace page. Your ignorance is probably shared by someone else, so please share your thoughts. All right. I hope you like the train example. I, I wanted some kind of heuristic to make it work, so I hope that helps. If not, um, Wikipedia actually has a nice page on that too. Um, so I'm going to walk and talk through uh, this equation. Or I'm sorry, this graphic right here in the middle. You can see these two functions, red and blue. I'm running red into blue. And I'm looking at the area of the product as red is running through blue. So you can see here at t equal negative 0 0.05, they finally intersect. We finally start to get some non-negative, uh, or I'm sorry, non-zero area. The timestamp associated with that, the t value associated with that inside of g is equal to minus 1. Um, that's due to some of the shifting that has occurred for this function. Um, this function, notice for blue, doesn't actually start at 0. It starts at negative 0 0.5. So no surprise that we start to get some area a little sooner at negative 1 than what we saw in our train example, right? All right, let's talk about some basic properties of convolution. Uh, the first thing I want to look at is what happens when we convolve with the delta function. So this is kind of a weird integral that we end up with, okay? If I can evolve any function, any train, with the delta function, I get that back out. Let's get a little bit uh, meta here for a second. So why, why does this matter? Why do I care about this property? In mathematics, anytime you have an operation that does something, the most important place to look is to see what op what version of that operation gives you back, i.e. as an identity, gives you back your input perfectly. Okay? So what thing, when I put it into uh, an, an operation like this, gives me back out my original input? And in this case, uh, that special identity is the delta function. Um, to put it in a different way, for addition, it's zero, right? x plus zero is equal to x. 
for multiplication, it's just 1, right? x times 1 is equal to x. So we need some kind of identity. Our identity here is delta t. That makes this operation very useful. It has, gives it a lot of nice properties. So let's look at what this is from a calculus perspective. By the way, most of the time, when you're hard, doing hard calculations for the convolution integral, uh, pay attention to these boundary conditions. Because a lot of times, for the kind of circuits that we're going to be dealing with, 9 times out of 10, uh, you can either make one of these a 0 or do something else that makes them finite. Uh, that makes your integral much, 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 much easier to solve. Okay, that's that's tip number one for those uh, integrals. Okay, so then we have t minus tau d tau. Okay, is equal to x, x of t. Notice here we have tau, tau, tau. That's the only place where t exists, and yet we spit out a t. Um, this is, by definition, the convolution of these two. Okay, The first one, the first function, sits still. The su second function moves. Okay, so when I'm doing this process, what I actually see here is just this flash upwards, right? This delta function is just a like a big flag pole. And all I care about is its intersection or its multiplication to whatever is underneath it at that point in time, t. So remember that t is what is moving our flag man, in this case, down the track. So as t increases, this flag will move down. He's running along the tau track where the f, I'm sorry, the x train is sitting. Okay, so what happens when I multiply, just straight up multiply, let's, let's not think about anything else. What happens when I multiply a delta function to any other uh, function? Well, it's just going to be kind of not well defined, right? It's going to only be defined at the point where the flag is. So let's take a look at that real quick. Let's say I have my axis here. We'll call it tau just to be consistent. And let's say I have some function. I'm just going to make it, let's do it in red. Let's just say I have some kind of, maybe a step function like that. That's nice. Or a pulse function like that. Um, and then here's my delta function come along like this. Okay. This goes up to infinity. It has area zero. zero or I'm sorry. It has area one. Um, and then this has, let's say this has value. Uh, let's make it interesting. Let's say this goes up to two. Okay. So if I ask myself now, I multiply these two things together, what's it look like? Well, it's zero all the way through, right? Until this spot here, something funny happens there. And then it's zero again, because my, oops, my function here is only defined at this particular point. And everywhere, everywhere else, it shall be zero. So that means that no matter what red is on over here or over here, it doesn't matter. It only matters what red is equal to right here. So it's picking out, dare I say, sifting that particular point of the original function, x of, x of uh, t or x of tau. And we just did ch change of variables there. No big deal. Um, so what we end up with is multiply that value, actually let me do it in red, this value two times the delta function. So it's just two times delta tau, wherever that may be. Now I know, now I know this should be at zero or whatever. Um, you can apply some shifting or whatever to put your mind at ease. But for the sake of example, all I have right here is just whatever the value of that function is, wherever this blip occurs, is just the value of that original function 
the times. Let me do this in proper colors so it makes even more sense. Of the value of the function at that particular point times delta at that particular point. And we can say that this, this is our zero point if you want to. I don't really care. And like I said, you can shift this to, to put your mind at ease if you want to um, get critical of that. But the main point here is that this is now, what, two, two infinities, right? What the hell does that even mean? <laughs> well, when you integrate it, remember what the definition of the integration was. If I'm integrating this, oh, well, this is just a constant, right? I'm just taking a value, a particular value of my function. So it's not a function over time or, or tau or anything anymore. All it is is just whatever it was for this guy. It really doesn't matter. This is just a constant that pops out. So this just becomes 2 times that integral of the delta function, right, with respect to tau. And we know what this is. This is just 1. So all I'm left with is my original value of my function x. And as it turns out, if I've set up my t's and my tau's correctly and the shifting and everything is accounted for correctly, I end up with my original function back out for each time step that I take. So that's it. It's just sifting out the values of of my original function by exploiting this integral where this only is defined at a particular point. And that's the point uh, t that you're at. Okay? So there you, there you go for that. The other way you can think about this is how I described it in the book. Um, it's whatever the flagman sees, right? And the flagman can only see where the flag post is. So that's another way to think about it. You can only see what's there, and when it integrates, when you do the integral of the product through, you get that rule, and you just see back that part of the train as you're moving past it, giving you this graph for the convolution. Okay. Whew. This is a lot of stuff, guys. I'm sorry. Like I said, it's the hardest hardest chapter if you can do this you can do anything that we have for the rest of the course you'll make it promise all right time shifting so i probably should have addressed this sooner um i might shift it backwards i don't know boom time shifting what do we have when we take some function i don't care what it is x of t and convolve it with the delta function shifted by t so the first question we should ask ourselves is, what the heck is this thing? Well, we know that our normal delta function is here, and we kind of touched on this just a second ago, but um, our normal delta function is here at zero. We can easily shift it to the right by t. Recall that we want the input of this delta function to be equal to zero. That's where the blip occurs. So at t, e t equal big T, That's what we get. So this is big T. So basically what I've done here is I've given my flagman a head start. Right? I've given them a head start with respect to uh, where they live on the, on the track. And so what you're going to see is that this is just going to sift the other, uh, the original function, x of t. It's going to shift the original function, x of t, by that uh, factor, or excuse me, that, uh, that term, big T. All right. So let's look at the math here. The book has a typo in it. Okay. I apologize. I need to fix that. Um, right here. This is wrong. There's no X in here. That's not good. So don't do that. <laughs> um, so here we have minus infinity to infinity X of tau, right? So now this is our equation. When is this guy not equal to zero? For what tau is this true? Okay. Well, it's when tau 
It's when tau is equal to this. So the only time that x, poor little x, actually gets to be multiplied to something that's not 0 is when x has an argument of t minus big T. Right? That's the only time that it actually exists in that integral. But when we think about it, remember our integral is only over tau. And now we've freed x to come outside, just, just like we talked about before, back here. Once we've uh, freed up x, you know, we're just multiplying it to that particular point. It doesn't really matter what tau is equal to anymore, because it doesn't affect our x function. So it falls out. We still have the integral of this delta function. I don't really care that the delta function got shifted anywhere. I'm taking the integral over all possible values. But I know that the only place where the delta function really matters is here at t. And I know that over all, all of this space, it's just, or I'm sorry, t minus uh, t. Over all this space, that is just equal to 1. Okay, so I'm just left with this. That's it. That's how time shifting works. Okay, so now you're just a bona fide time traveler. So you've mastered time shifting. Okay, perfect. It's going to get all wibbly wobbly. Anyways, <laughs> got to keep myself entertained here. Okay. All right, we're getting pretty short on time uh, for this lecture, so I it's going to probably go a little long. I apologize. But we're going to talk about integration and then zip through the properties that you should be familiar with. One of the homeworks actually goes through the derivations of those. Um, so I'm going to leave that mostly as an exercise and just kind of cover them. Uh, integration is very similar to the... Uh, time sifting or the sifting property and the time shifting property uh, except that now instead of having that single delta function there if we convolve x with a unit function I'm sorry a step function then we end up with the integral of x okay so let's say our output here's our input This is what's in the book, and I want to explain this real quick. So what this is saying is I may have some function right, that exists here. This is t. I may have some function x of t. It does whatever. I don't really care. But what I'm doing by multiplying it by ut is I'm cutting it off right here. Okay, and I'm saying anything before this point, make it 0 and keep anything after this point. That's all this is saying. So this is just making all of x t before t equals zero be equal to zero, okay? It's just shutting off that function prior to time t equals zero. So don't be thrown off by that. And then we're gonna convolve that with the unit step function uh, and see what we get out. If x of t is already defined as a function that only lives between zero and infinity, then you don't need this, all right? So we take our integral minus infinity to infinity of x tau, u tau times u of t minus tau, by definition. These two are conjoined together as a singular function, so we can just let them go together for the ride, d tau. And this is a technique, this is probably be the number two tip that I would say for, for solving these uh, convolution integrals. Um, first one was, remember, our limits of integration. Um, this one is related to that, definitely. Um, I guess it's more like a clarification of that first tip. Uh, so U of T is only turned on for only 
non-zero for tau greater than zero, right? So that means that this function argument of the integral is only non-zero when tau is greater than zero. So effectively, I can look at my limits of integration, and I know that any tau before zero doesn't do crap for me. So I can just turn this into zero to infinity x tau. And since the unit uh, step function is just one between zero and infinity, right? I can just let go of my unit step function now because the limits of integration are going to cradle this function only in the region that I care about. That is from zero to infinity. So I've imposed this condition by changing my limits of integration and saying that otherwise it's equal to zero and I don't care about it anymore. All right. So that goes away. And now we're just left with this guy. Well, for that one, it's just the same thing, but the other direction. Remember what this function looks like. So let's take a peek. Here's, uh, and I'm going to draw this with respect to tau. It's just that flip and shift. It looks like this, right? And it's a unit step function. So the height here is one. And this shift happens downshifts at t. Recall that this interior argument is zero when t is equal to tau. So I know that my drop off has to happen here. My function argument, the thing that I care about because I'm integrating with respect to t right now, my function argument is with respect to tau. So I know that on this tau axis, if I'm looking at this function, that it has been reversed. Notice the minus sign there. And therefore, it's 1 prior to t, and then it drops down into 0 ever afterward. So the upshot here is that um, I'm actually only defining my integral over 0 to infinity. So I only care about this region here. Therefore, um, this just becomes a pulse between 0 and and t. Well, the same argument can be made here that we made before uh, for this function. So now I just have my, my the only time I'm non-zero inside this entire integral. Oops. Inside this entire integral now is between zero and t. So actually, my limits of integration get updated once more. So I'll write this out first, and then I can use this to write a new limit of integration, 0 to t of x of tau. tau x of tau is just watching all this chaos happen. And that's it. Now I just have an integral of x. t is just some running dummy variable, and I'm integrating x from 0 to t. So I've created integration of a function from a convolution. Pretty handy. All right, moving on. You can do other properties with this. You can create pulses and, and other things, by the way, with the integration. Um, look to the book on that. Uh, it should be page 104. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the algebraic properties. And as much as I'd like to sit here and derive these for you guys, um, I, just, I just don't have time. We talk too much about the convolution itself. So anyways, um, if y is equal to a convolved with b, okay, then we have the commutative property which means that a convolved with b 
is equal to uh, B convolved with A. So this is actually an important property that we didn't say up front that should have kind of, you know, you probably assumed it to be true because you can always uh, do this operation with most of the operations that you do. But actually, as it turns out, most of the operations in the larger sphere of what we call algebra or algebras, because uh, there are multiple, you can't always do this. You can't always make this switch. And when you do, there are sometimes other consequences or things that you have to account for. Um, so uh, the order in which you do matrices and vectors, for example, makes a big difference, right? Um, so that's one, one instance where this doesn't necessarily uh, hold true. But it does hold true for convolution. It's very useful that way. Um, the reason this is true, uh, you can prove it with calculus and algebra, but really it comes down to a matter of relativity. If I'm moving a train towards another train, one's going, you know, 10 miles an hour, the other's going zero. Neither of them really care about which one is actually moving. They both just care about crashing um, and how fast that crash is occurring, right? And when that crash occurs. So from a relativistic standpoint, it's the same either way. Either A is crashing into B or B is crashing into A, but they're both just crashing, Okay. That's why I love the train analogy. Okay, commutative, another way to remember this property by name is that when you commute somewhere, you're, you're moving back and forth between two places. You're moving back and forth between two places. You can see the swap here. It works. That helps memorize that. You know, keep you honest. Uh, associative, don't worry, I got a good one for this too. It's kind of weird. Um, but if I have A convolved with B and then I convolve with C, this is actually equal to A convolved with B convolved with, oops, what, that, that didn't make any sense, convolved with C, okay? So I can actually change the parentheses, okay? And before we had all the, you know, the Rona, we, uh, we, you know, we all used to go around and shake hands as associates. So if you're an associate somewhere, um, you know, you, you go and you shake hands with other associates. So these look like little hands, right? These here. And so you exchange handshakes. You, you move your handshakes around. You don't actually move anybody around. Everybody stays in the same company. They all stay in the same position, but they all uh, shake hands, okay? And that's how I remember associative property. If it works for you, go with it. If it's stupid, throw it in the garbage. All right. Uh, next property is the distributive property. Okay. And this one, I mean, you know what distribute means, but... Um, you know, if you really need something, if you're a distributor, uh, you're, you know, dropping things off at different places. So you can look at it this way. Uh, if I have A convolved with um, A, B, which is added to another function. Notice I'm not convolving here. Okay, that's important. But I can distribute my convolution to two locations, okay? I'm like UPS over here. Here we go. A of T convolved with B of T plus A of T convolved with C of T, all right? So I'm distributing this whole operation here. I'm a distributor worldwide, all right? What can, what can art do for you? All right, um... Differentiation. So differentiation is going to become really important for us down the line. I'm going to note it here, but here are the two. OK. 
Okay, here are the two rules that you kind of need to, to know for the notation. Um, I think this is one that Tom built in here. I, again, I don't care for this notation up here like this, but it kind of works well in this case um, just because it's convenient. And that's really, at the end of the day, math is just about convenient notation. There's really nothing special about the way things are written. It's just all made up. Okay, so we use these two things to kind of represent differentiation and integration respectively. Um, if I have A of T involved with B of T, this is actually equal to the integral of A involved with the uh, derivative of B which is equivalent, and this is a weird one, to the derivative of A involved with the integral of B. This is a really strange result, but it's not that crazy because when you think about what the definition of a convolution is, it really is just an integral. At the end of the day, it's an integral. So the fact that this pops out of it as a, as a property where integrals and, and derivatives um, do this is strange, but shouldn't be totally unexpected. And as a matter of fact, the way differentiation interacts with our convolutions and actually our, our transform as our Laplace transform when we get to it is one of the most fundamental, uh, fundamentally beneficial things about convolution and why we need this operation. Uh, the other things have to do with signal processing. So if you look at that wiki page, you can see things like autocorrelation and cross-correlation. You've probably heard these terms in uh, at least movies and shows somewhere. <laughs> but uh, basically, it enables us to analyze signals when we do a convolution operation or cross-correlation or autocorrelation, which is, these are just special kinds of convolutions, essentially. Um, so this opens up a whole new world for you guys. I won't, I won't sing the Aladdin song, I promise. But it really is a whole new world of, of mathematics for you because you now have a completely new tool. It's like learning how to multiply numbers together. You've just learned how to multiply numbers together for the first time. And now you have this tool to go out into the world and do other great things like create a, uh, a transform that's going to completely change the way you see circuits in terms of frequencies. And we'll get to that uh, in the next few lectures here as we continue our adventure through convolution land. All right, see you guys next time.